Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gems and Jokes with me, Ariel Tivon of Tivon Fine Jewelry. Well, we got the first podcast out the way, and I am happy to say it is a roaring success. And when I say roaring success, I mean outside of family and friends, probably a total of about five or six strangers listened. Thank you so much for the support uh, to all those five people, plus family and friends, of course, and we hope to do better moving forward. So today I am very excited. We're officially having our first guest. Uh, not only that, we will also be helping a charity. So exciting times. We're definitely looking to push upwards and onwards and improve this podcast. For all those first-time listeners joining in uh, who don't have a clue what this is about, this podcast is a light-hearted look at the behind-the-scenes of the gems and jewelry world. We hope to bring you some information as well as education, but really a whole lot of great stories about the industry. Uh, nothing too serious. This isn't a lecture. Um, we're looking to have some some good times, some good entertainments, a few laughs, and uh, really just some great stories for you. For all those tuning in again, thank you once again. You are obviously gluttons for punishment, and I will continue with my awful dad jokes as long and as hard as I can. So here we go. So as I said, today we have a great guest, certainly a lot more exciting than I am. So recently, we tried to improve our marketing, Tivon Fine Jewelry I'm talking about, and we came to the conclusion we want to sign a brand ambassador. And I think everybody got on their hands and knees and said, thank God we're getting somebody who looks a whole lot better than me. Because originally I said, well, you know, I'm the boss. I'm the face of the business. Uh, what about being the actual face of the business? Um, after the crickets dissipated or and a little bit of laughter, I said, no, seriously, guys, what about me being the face? And people kind of responded and said, uh, yeah, listen, you are an amazing face for radio. You have an amazing face for podcasts. But I think we need to try and set the bar a tad bit higher for a brand ambassador and certainly for the face of Tivon. Yeah, maybe a face for Dunkin' Donuts, but jewelry, we're not sure you're the perfect fit. So let's keep looking. And I think they were right because... We signed on Leonora Smee, who is our guest today. She is absolutely gorgeous. She is smart. She is talented and really an all-round great human being. And we're going to be also speaking to her about the charity that she supports, which is the Berkshire Youth Trust. She's going to be telling us all about it. And please, afterwards, you know, if you follow the link in the description section or the comment section, uh, please donate. Please try and help the charity. Let's try and do some good. Let's try and make a difference in the lives of some very needy uh, young people. So we'll get into that a little bit later. To all our listeners, I've already introduced Leonora, uh, our new brand ambassador, and I'm very happy to welcome her onto our first podcast with a guest. So here we go. Thanks, Leonora. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Yeah. I'm, uh, first of all, delighted to be your new brand ambassador. I feel honored to represent such an incredible brand and for someone that creates such beautiful products. So I'm delighted to be part of the team. And yeah, I'm excited to be recording my first podcast. Well, first of all, you're the guinea pig. So hopefully we, we get this right between <laughs> me and you. And uh, you say you're on it now. Just wait. Let's let's hope everything goes smoothly in time. But no, we're incredibly lucky to be working with you. And I think, you know, things are going to be great ahead. As I've already, you know, told some of our listeners, you know, we were thinking about me being the face of the brand. Obviously, I'm the owner and everything. But I think literally everybody is on their hands and knees thanking God that I'm not the face of the brand because I don't <laughs> think we'd sell anything. You know, I, I can talk and a great face for radio, but for selling jewelry, we'll leave that to the professionals. And that's where you come in. So th thank you for helping us with that. <laughs> well, very wise, very wise. <laughs> wow, yeah. We're learning, we're learning. So first and foremost, just give our listeners a little bit of background as to, you know, who you are, how you came to the point that you're at. Because if I'm not mistaken, you actually started your career as a professional show jumper. Am I, am I right in that? 
Yes, you're definitely right. Yeah, I've had a very fortunate, let's start there, I, extremely, extremely fortunate start to life. So I started riding at a very young age. So I started riding when I was about four. Parents not horsey at all. In fact, my mother was terrified of horses and my father was equally terrified of the bills. So <laughs> it was um, something that I just fell in love with and was passionate about. So although my parents begged me to do ballet, yeah, that was really not where I was going to go. So I started riding when I was when I was young. And then when I was 13, I had the opportunity to go to a professional stable and really understand what it takes to be a professional show jumper. And I had the training and the management and really my hobby turned into my profession. I was so passionate about it. And I understood the dedication that it takes to sort of get to that level. And really that's where it started to take a change because obviously my education was first and foremost, my parents were very, very um, strict in that my my school came first. Yeah, well, it's probably and like me, your parents don't, they want you to have at least something to fall back on. In absolutely, case the whole show absolutely. jumping thing doesn't work out. So show jumping obviously is a dangerous sport and you have the fact that you are riding an animal. You don't quite know what it's going to do. It's not like driving a car. So there is always the element of something happening. And my parents wanted to make sure that my education was sort of up to scratch, I suppose. And so my school, I I ran my, my horses alongside my school. My school was fantastic at sort of making sure that I had time to ride and that I was catching up on schoolwork. And when I was 15, I left school, so very, very young, and I started to travel the world riding the horses. And I continued my education with homeschooling and tutors via video calls and and yeah, so I I've spent my the beginning of my adult life traveling the world, um, meeting some extraordinary people, riding in the best arenas of the world. Mm. One of the most luxurious um fancy spectacular sparkly sports it's sort of second to formula one really and we travel from Saint-Tropez to Cannes, Monaco, the Middle East, Paris I mean we get to travel to the most amazing places and show jump underneath the Eiffel Tower it's being sponsored by Rolex so it really is unbelievable it must also be quite uh, physically taxing I mean you know you've got to be physically fit to control a horse and uh you know definitely and as the world we develop as human beings it's always becoming about sort of your mental health and your fitness and what you're eating and in the olden days when you think about sort of Harvey Smith and John Whitaker they would be rolling out of the pub and getting on the horse in the morning still sort of tipsy from the night before and win the Grand Prix well that doesn't happen nowadays it's very much like we are both athletes you have the horse and you have the rider and yes i mean from what you're eating to going in the gym to being psychologically ready to win um that was something and actually something that took a long time for me i was i was quite a nervous rider a lot of people don't know that but before a grand prix i would be just terrified i remember i was in monaco and I walked the course and my trainer sort of looked at me and said, was basically subtly trying to tell me that possibly it might be a good idea to leave this one out. <laughs> and if you say that to me, yeah. I sort of do the absolute opposite and say, well, watch me win. And that's kind of what happened. Although I was very ill beforehand. No one knew I was so terrified. I was so nervous. And well, I went in and yeah, we, we won the two star Grand Prix in Monaco. Sorry to interrupt. Would you say it's good? preparation for being I mean surely it made you quite competitive do you think that prepares you especially for your next phase in life which we're going to come to now which is you know being ready for launching your own business and being a real go-getter that the fact that you have been competitive essentially gives you good grounding for moving on Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, in some ways, it's bred into me. My father was a professional footballer. And sometimes I'd call him and tell him that I was second in a Grand Prix in Arken. And he would say, well, you lost. And I'd say, no, Dad. I <laughs> Lovely. Sounds like second. my dad. Yeah. yeah when you bring sport. home 98% for a test and he says, 
Yeah. Where's the other two? Exactly. So in his eyes, and if I didn't win, if I wasn't number one, I'd lost. So yes, definitely. You sort of have the feeling of of hunger the entire time. You get that sense of, of winning yeah. and you spend your life from the training aspect to traveling to sort of the whole preparing for that two minutes in the ring. You're hungry to win. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of rounds that don't go to plan, sure. but it the, is the rounds that you win that make you want it more for sure and that has definitely set me up in order to to sit back and look at what I want to do in my career understand my goals and then work out of way and how to get there and how to win basically so yes it definitely does come back to show jumping and let's but, not forget uh, thanks to all those pushy parents out there who who prod us along <laughs> and we are constant disappointments until we win thank 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 you to all those parents <laughs> So tell me, so Definitely. next, so, so, okay, so show jumping comes to an end at some point. Um, what age was that when you finished? So show jumping, I had a nasty accident. So it was inevitable. Sometimes, well, you get, you fall off a horse and you get back on until the one time that you physically can't. And I used to fall off. I mean, you should see some of these falls and you'd think that girl is not going to get back up. And I was wow. up and I was riding the next horse in the ring within hours but unfortunately, I had a fall. I was on a young horse and she rotated and I shattered my shoulder and ruptured all the ligaments between my neck and my shoulder and also my collarbone. So it was a little bit of a messy fall. And I got told that I was out of the sport for at least 18 months. Wow. So... I was sat in the dilemma thinking, okay, I'm at a, I'm at a crossroads, certainly for 18 months. Mm -hmm. Do I sit in Germany? Cause that's where I was living at the time. Do I sit yeah. in Germany? Happy place, watching Germany. The, yeah, watching my horses being ridden by other people and competing by other people and sort of sit there moaning, or do I get myself back to London, get myself immersed into a market that I love and I enjoy like the luxury market and get a job. That's what I had to I had to get back down to reality I was at the very top of the my area and I was living this very luxurious wonderful lifestyle and then crash bang wallop straight back down to rock bottom back time to actually work now <laughs> most people say that but actually if you knew what went into show jumping no. but yeah I had to move home Got a yeah. job and then started well started my my path to meeting you and yeah I've immersed myself in the luxury world I have enjoyed every single moment of it I've in create sort of created some incredible brand connections met some really inspirational people and I love speaking to people I love meeting people going to amazing places and at the end of the day representing what I believe is pure luxury and the best craftsmanship so uh, would you say also I mean you sound like you know you you you, you know what you want you're quite to a degree I know a little bit about you you're quite entrepreneurial would you say you know, you had a good grounding from your family. Are they quite entrepreneurial? Would they, did they sort of push you along and guide you? Or is, you know, in the same way, I think what I'm trying to get at is that in the same way I grew up, you know, around a very entrepreneurial father and kind of like horse riding to an extent that, you know, you get, it gets inbred. You get, it's built in that competitiveness, that entrepreneurial spirit it doesn't always just come naturally. It's kind of sometimes it's great to have a guiding light and, and somebody. So did you have that from your family? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I look up to my dad. My dad started from absolutely nothing. So he is a self-made man and watching him from a young age sort of grafting and working extremely hard to fund and provide what we had growing up. I was extremely fortunate growing up and I'm very grateful to that. I think in terms of it being bred into me, Absolutely. I have the drive and I've got it in my blood 100%. But as you say, sometimes God didn't bless you with that. And I yeah. think that it's it's half and half, really. I have the blood inside of me that I'm very hungry and I have the work ethic of my father. But equally, he wasn't massively pushy. And very much to this day, he will say, Leonora, tell me what it is that you want to do. 
and we'll we'll figure it out. He's sort of not saying to push me down a certain avenue. Right. So sometimes let you figure it out I for think, yourself to a degree. And sometimes that's really hard because he's almost too supportive. He's sort of like, well, tell me anything. Tell me anything that you want to do. Yeah. And sometimes I'm in a very fortunate position that that I have a few different opportunities that I could do. Mm-hmm. And narrowing it down to one and doing that one very, very well is sometimes harder than having one option and being pushed to succeed in that option. So yes and no, I would say to that. So yes, inbred into me and I've been supported 100% through yeah. my show jumping career and my, and my business career. But I think it takes sometimes, it, t- it takes the individual to want it themselves yeah. to make it a success. It's that hunger you, you talked about. I mean, I see a lot of people, you know, they go down the academic route and, and you know, you can study to be, you can study business, you can study all, all sorts of things. But hunger is something that doesn't come to everyone. And I think hunger actually is probably more important to success than probably anything you'd ever learn from a book or from, you know, yeah. from, from yeah. academics or whatever, you know, I'm not saying that they're not important, but hunger, I think sometimes drives you. It's a much bigger proponent than anything yeah. else that uh, in order to achieve whatever it is, whether you're an athlete or whether you're in business. Absolutely. I agree. So let's talk branding and marketing. Obviously in the jewelry world, very, very important uh, how we come across, you know, how we want our consumers to perceive us. I watched a great documentary the other day on Steve Jobs and obviously a very, a very brilliant individual, also a very flawed individual. But one of the things that sort of struck me is something he said that marketing is a set of values that you want your ideal consumer to buy into. It's something that represents your company. It's not just, you know, getting it out there and getting in front of someone. You actually want people to commit to a set of values from that perspective. So I think what, you know, probably one of the toughest things today is actually to do marketing because there's so much noise. There's so much, you know, advertising going out there and especially to women. And I think what is your perception on how marketing and advertising is coming across to women these days? Because obviously we've got all kinds of issues, everything from sort of the PC brigade saying this is right for women and that's not right for women. How do you feel the advertising and the marketing world is is getting it? Are, are they getting it right today or does it sort of not feel like it's actually connecting w- with women especially you know of your age or just across the board well first of all it's a great question so being a millennial myself and being a young person and especially a woman when I'm browsing a website being that typical consumer like you say I want to buy into the values of a business or a brand so I want to buy into something that is eco-friendly that's something that has taken a huge turn in the last, I would say, five years, and making sure that things are being sort of economically created and designed um, in a way that's environmentally friendly, being in some ways vegan. You hear about all of these things, and I think that that Don't is Don't get me important. started on vegans. This is You're talking I to a South, a South African carnivore. <laughs> we, we don't... We don't, you know, so, but I don't know if you know, vegan is a South African word. It means bad hunter. And so we love them. <laughs> um, let them go so off and, true. you know, but. Yes, no, yeah. I'm not a vegan myself, but I think it Thank is God. Good co- It's good that I know that now after you've become the brand ambassador, but even better to know. Great. <laughs> But I think it is important that everything is being is looking down the line. So in a hundred years time, we're not going to run out of any different uh, materials or something like that. And I think being a consumer, you're looking at that and you're saying, okay, well, this brand here is thinking about the future. They're paying their women um, employees correctly. They're part of this organization that looks after certain charities in Africa. And, and you want to buy into a company that is doing things correctly. That is what I would say. And in terms of marketing, from a woman's point of view, we obviously want it to be aesthetically pleasing. Now, when we talk about it being environmentally friendly, there's nothing really worse than seeing kind of a picture that is is sort of 
really quite bare and not very pretty, which in yeah. talking about environmentally friendly, you sort of think of like green recycling, sort of things like that. So it is a definitely a juggle between getting things right and being understood in the marketplace and doing the right thing and also creating a product that is absolute beauty and craftsmanship and having something of excellence. And it's making sure that you're juggling that correctly to ensure that you are getting the right consumer and the consumer is understanding what it is that you're trying to put out in the world. That is what I would say as a woman, a millennial um, shopping now nowadays when yeah. looking at the marketing and the PR that these brands are putting out. What about, I mean, you know, maybe I'm very old school, but you know, when I was coming up and, and studying various things, it was a, almost like an old adage within the marketing and the advertising world that essentially sex sells. Now, obviously times have changed dramatically, you know, all of a sudden everybody's almost too nervous to say anything to anybody in the wrong way. But at the end of the day, as I say, maybe I'm old school, but I still believe that in many senses, women are still women. They still have their wants, their desires, their, their likes, their dislikes, and so on. What, how do you see a lot of advertisers and marketers, um, are, they, are they becoming, in your opinion, especially as a millennial and as a female, do you think they're becoming too PC? Are they almost forgetting what the essence of a woman is? Or are they, do you sort of buy, like this very gender neutral aesthetic sort of thing? I'm not saying you bring anybody down, but in the name of placating a lot of people, are we forgetting really the essence of women in terms of advertising or are people actually getting it right? What do you think about that? I think nowadays, like you say, it is, it's, it's becoming a bit of a taboo subject. When you talk about a woman and women's rights, and don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely for women's rights. But I do think you're right in saying that at the end of the day, a, a woman is meant to be beautiful and a woman is meant to portray a, a beautiful outset. It's becoming quite a lot. Well, well, um, well, hold on. Do you need to cater for everybody? Because at the end of the day, if you're a very specialized product, then surely you're trying to represent or at least target a niche. Do you have to go? I mean, I see so many huge companies that are trying to be, I mean, this, my kids taught me this word, by the way, they, they're trying to be so woke that they're just trying to make sure that they're completely neutral. But by being so neutral, they actually wind up alienating some of their biggest demographics. So, you know, I, I think yeah. maybe the balance is advertising without offending. But the, que <laughs> the question is, if that, is that even possible today? Because everybody seems to be offended by everybody. That's the and uh, I, that I think they're the blaming problem. millennials, but I, I think you guys got a bad rap. I don't think it's the millennials. I think it's maybe the, the, the guys who follow you who, who are pushing things even harder. I think it is a difficult, very, very difficult area because at the end of the day, there are, everybody has a right, whether you are a female, male, um, transgender, neutral. And I think it is really, really important for a brand nowadays to, to make sure that that is understood. But I do think it is becoming such a, a taboo subject that like you say, they are chopping a huge part of their demographic. And therefore, yeah. and I think that, Brands shouldn't be criticized for having just a female ambassador or brands shouldn't be criticized and just having a male ambassador. It's not being about sexist. It's just about. It's about the being... product. It's about the product. It's about the product about and, and selling it to who you're trying to, to sell it to. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, I, I've always been surrounded by females. 99.9% uh, .9 of our product, for example, is targeted at females. Yes, we may be missing out part of it, but it's not because I'm trying to alienate anybody. It's because that's my target demographic and I want to advertise okay, in a yeah. way that appeals most to my target demographic. Luckily enough, I'm not a huge listed brand. I'd probably get lambasted for, for leaving somebody out, but I think, I think it's about knowing who you want to appeal to and just focusing on that, especially if you're a small business. We just can't please everybody. I definitely agree with that. So here's a question actually posed by one of my daughters who's very interested in marketing and the world of advertising. 
So she wanted to know, well, actually, as a brand ambassador, what, what is it that you look for? I think you've answered in part, but what do you look for really, uh, rather than a consumer, as a brand ambassador, what sort of values do you look for in a brand that makes it mesh and gel that it's for you? So I look at myself and I understand what I want to portray. What do I want to show my followers, the people who look up to me, the other brands? And I would say that I represent, I adore the luxury brands. And that is something I'm passionate about, supporting luxury. And luxury is something that is craftsmanship. It's something that's rare, something that's elegant, classy, and beautiful. And in terms of being an ambassador, when I look at different brands and and people approaching me, Mm -hmm. I get a lot of different offers and a lot of brands that come to me. And if they don't fit into those categories and have the right values, then it's not for me. And in some ways, I won't be able to represent that brand in the best way possible because our values are just different. And so I would say that understand yourself and understand your own values and the way that you want to go before you start approaching brands. Got you. In terms of product, obviously a very important question to us, diamonds versus colored gemstones. Where does your preference lie? Be very careful how you answer, but just in general, where is your I'm preference? Woman. I'm a woman. The more the merrier. <laughs> you it's get to change your mind every day. Diamonds okay. in the middle and some gems around the sides or vice versa. I'd yeah. be a very happy lady. <laughs> perfect. Perfect answer. Well said as a brand ambassador. Tick box. You, you, you've done well. <laughs> Also, a very important question, what do you think, millennial and just as yourself and so on, So, in terms of jewelry preference, what do you feel about, let's say, real jewelry, in other words, made with real gemstones and uh, precious metals and so on, versus the sort of mass production fashion jewelry? What, what's your take on that? I would say that they're in two very different worlds. Although they are jewelry, they are they sit in very different markets because ultimately it comes to price point. It comes to people being able to afford it. I think there is a market for both, absolutely, because if you have a certain outfit that you just need something to go with and something quite bold, then you possibly don't want to spend so much money buying a necklace that's just going to go with that one outfit. Sure. So I definitely think there is there is room for both, 100%. And then, of course, Leonora, one of the major things that we want to try and do with this podcast, as I told you, we want to actually try and do some good. And one of the the things we are going to do today is talk about a charity, uh, which is very special to you. It's something that your family is involved in. And so I'm I'm going to let you talk about uh, the charity that you're supporting. And we remind our listeners, please, if you feel that it is something that you can help with, Please follow the link in the description and donate generously. So please tell us about the charity that you're very involved in. Yes. Well, thank you very much. So my family have been heavily, heavily involved with Berkshire Youth for many, many years. My father being a a very active president for over 40 years. He's extremely passionate about uh, youth work and creating a safe place and supporting services for young people. So I'm sure you are aware, I mean, there's been huge problems affecting young people today and they're a regular feature of the news, sort of knife crime, drug abuse. And really those children have a huge lack of access to education and understanding and learning fundamental skills to develop them into adulthood. And the problem is that these children are not getting the education. So they're going into, they're going into crime, they're going into drugs and they'll tease them with a pair of trainers and the the children will want the pair of trainers and then they're indebted to a drug lord and it's getting to the point where these kids are in crisis because they're either going to end up in jail or they're going to end up dead so we're in a situation where we need to do something and unfortunately the worst case has been the fact that youth work budgets have been cut by 500 million since 2011. This is, you're talking about, this is a government cut. Yes, government cuts. Exactly. So these cuts have seen a sort of a marked shift from prevention towards supporting these young youngsters. Mm -hmm. And 
they're getting to the point where they're at, at high risk and they're reaching crisis level. And really, we are putting in fundamental sort of the, the charity is putting in fundamental things to ensure that there is a safe, warm environment, that they're able, able to educate children before it's too late. So give us a couple of specific examples of what the charity does. How do they help these kids in need, these kids in crisis who are now left being abused and and taken advantage of by drug lords and left with no education? So what does the charity specifically do to help these kids? So the charity raises money to create a place for these children to go to. So they're safe, they're warm, they're having uh, the education that they need. And so a specific project that's just that is that is happening as we speak Mm -hmm. is called is in Newbury and it's called the Waterside Project. So we have recently required the Waterside building in Newbury and it is going through a complete refurb. So the building will have state of the art youth facilities and they'll have classrooms they'll have climbing walls they'll have areas where they can go and and sing and be in a band and food halls where they're able to have some warm food in the evenings and it will also have a place where if there are children who don't have a home to go to and and don't have parents then those children are also able to stay there Well, that's great. And, you know, what I love the sound is that nobody's, uh, I think society is to a great extent today is has come to a point where they're saying, well, it's not my job. It's not, it's not my responsibility. Uh, It's the government's. It's become a big thing that, you know, everybody says, oh, it's the other guy's job. It's the government's task. You know, what are our taxes being paid for? But the fact is that government's got a lot on its plate and it, it requires people who actually give a damn and actually care to make a difference like you, like your family, like all those who are involved in the youth trust. And I think that's just incredible. So please, again, I'm just reminding everybody, look at the link, go and study what the trust is all about. If you want to get involved, get a hold of the trust or let us know, we'll put you in touch, but please do, if you can make a difference, just donate or go and see how you can get involved. I think it's a fantastic cause and thank you for bringing it to our attention. It's been amazing having you on. Uh, You've given us a quite a wide perspective, everything from show jumping and modeling to raising charity and giving us an insight into the millennial mind, which is a very dangerous place. (laughs) I think think you'll find a lot of companies (laughs) and people are scared of what is going on in the millennial mind, but it sounds like you've got your head on your shoulders. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. We hope to have you hopefully in the future. For anybody who wants to see more of what Leonora is doing, go to Instagram. That's her playground. Have a look at either at our Instagram page or Leonora Smee's Instagram page. And I think you'll see some fantastic stuff. So thank you again. And uh, lovely to have you on. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's been such a pleasure to speak about such a huge array of different subjects. No, absolute pleasure. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic having our first guest. Uh, I'd like to thank our our listeners today for tuning in and listening to my podcast. If you found it interesting and entertaining, please do follow me for future episodes and share this podcast with friends, family, colleagues, your auntie, your uncle, whoever can listen. Amazing. Please also leave a comment or questions if if you have one, and I'll do my best to answer or perhaps even make it a future episode. Let's be honest, I need the material, so please do ask questions. Please do send in your comments. Most importantly, please follow the link in the description field and donate generously today to the Berkshire Youth Trust. Uh, They need your help and uh, you really, you will be changing people's lives. Let's do some good today. This has been Gems and Jokes with Ariel Tivon. Thanks again for listening. Have an awesome day.